here. And uh, it's a great delight to, um, you know, sort of uh, lead a panel on um, issues of education. It's a subject very close to my heart. I think it keeps coming in my writings in different ways I do. Uh, I wanted to um, open by saying how it uh, you know, has, I think, um, we are in a very interesting moment in education in all of Asia. I mean, I um, moved here after teaching uh, many years in the US, and one thing that struck me when I was teaching, um, um, I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, like many of us here, I had a very traditional literary education. I went to St. Xavier's College at Calcutta University, and it was wonderful. We had, and yet when I went to the US, there were several boundaries opened up in a kind of radical way, really striking. The one thing that really struck me was when I was teaching at Stanford, uh, I noticed that there was this one proposal given to us from the Department of Computer Science to open a two dual pilot programs, uh, computer science and English, and computer science and music. And it was quite fascinating that, you know, that the proposal came from the computer science department. And then I looked around and I saw that you know, this is the computer science department which actually created Silicon Valley. And this is clearly very uh, interdisciplinary. If you look at the startups, the kind of cultures there, it's all very, you know, everything. I mean, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, it's sort of a bringing together of many different ways of thinking. And that got me thinking about something that used to be called liberal arts, in a very traditional way, how the different disciplines came together. And I started wondering, why didn't we receive this kind of an education? Why didn't we get this education? We have brilliant teachers, we have great pedagogic traditions, and yet why were, you know, kind of subjects catered a kind of, kind of division, kind of compartmentalized, kind of barriers? And then I really realized that goes back to the British colonial history. The British colonial history is what created universities, a university system created to sort of de design clubs to kind of stamp people in large numbers. And this, you know, a lot of things went around, and I wrote on this subject, and finally where I am today, I, I came to join Ashoka University, where I, uh, my, my, one of my roles was to set up the first creative writing program in the country, sort of where we actually give degrees in creative writing, and uh, as a practicing writers, we teach, and we sort of introduce writing as part of the liberal arts curriculum. And as I look back, as I see that, you know, what we work with is where the students come from. And I'm very, you know, fortunate here to have three speakers who really do the foundational work of the students who come here. And so I want to open with the question that, you know, so much of this kind of interdisciplinary liberal arts education that we're trying to do at this new universities like Ashoka kind of depart from a model. So the invariable question then is, what does alternative education look like at the K-12 level, at the kind of primary to secondary. And this is something, you know, because when we get students, the age of 18, you know, it's already too late. They're already fully formed adults. There's only certain things we can do. And we are already battling the kind of dominance of the CBSE curriculum, the board exams, the paranoia of mugging up things, which again goes back to this very much this sort of you know, pub, British public university model. And how does one change that? So my opening question to you know all of you would be, you know, what is an alternative education? You know, what is what is education it's like Oroville, like Krishnamurti Foundation? It's a very interesting moment for me. I'm taking a trip next week to Bangalore to look at Rishi Valley School. My uh, daughter is in class five, and we are really getting to a point where the CBSE model is really constricting on us. So what is it? And how do you where you are, what does it look like? And, and related to that, what does it mean to have an education which is not only alternative, but rooted in the community? Because often we are pushing an education that is packageable and transferable globally. And what all of these people are doing here is not only having an alternative model of education, but actually you know, sort of having an education which speaks to the community in a way a kind of, a kind of packaged education doesn't. So maybe uh, Martin, I'll start with you with that question. Then. Well, Shaka, we didn't have a chance, or you didn't give us a chance to talk with each other before. So I would just like to mention that here we are, have two models of education. One is the Orbindo in Pondicherry, where Dr. Hatsi 
customers coming from. And the second one is right here, grounded in this place, which is Shantinikitan, the Tagorean model of education. Both you can call alternative since they are not rooted in the government scheme or in the British scheme of education. So this is just as an introduction. The second part of my introduction is we started a school. We met Borovaski, Dr. Borovaski and myself 25 years ago, 24 years ago, near Shantinikitan. And I will say it in a different way now also. You know, we heard, we hear all kinds of things about Shantinikitan, about Vishwavarati. I think that is what Tagore has become, good or bad or good. But we are here, even those who live here, are not aware, and you are probably not aware of it either, that all around Shantinikita, in a perimeter of 20 kilometers, have sprung up all kinds of pedagogical education initiatives, small ones, they have died down maybe, they persevere, they uh, don't, are not becoming um, alternative anymore, they are doing the mainstream, etc., etc. But there are these multiple initiatives, all are in Shantinikitan, and I call this also the influence of Rabindranath. In the same way, Borobaski with another friend, Bukharansa, to Shantai, educated in Shantinikitan by Vishwamarathi, has started a school outside, about 8 to 10 kilometers from here, that time there were only Madras, and tried to follow two ideas. One is the idea of Rabindranath School, his pedagogical ideas and the needs of the Shantal rural poor children. Shantal rural poor children. Bringing these two streams together and make it an educational effort which should work. And it has been working for the last 24 years. So I wanted to only give this introduction to you. When Anjum came to ask me to speak today, I said no, because we have Borobaski, who is the leader of the school for many years, has founded it. He should speak for himself. This is a new step. Why should I, as a mentor and, and uh, guide and helper all, all these years, why should I speak? I'm not part of the school, obviously. I'm neither educated nor by the school, nor have I been a teacher in the school, as borrowers. So I am only telling about the school's um, ideas now, as of what I have said. I want to introduce Borovaski, and now I put my chair a little further back. And please talk to Borovaski. Thank you, Martina. Yeah, it was 24 years ago that we started this school. In fact, we met on a station, and uh, I was a, a schoolboy. In fact, I was going to the car, yeah, the high school, and he was going to Germany, and we met at the Brantic station. And it was coincidence that we came to know each other, and we had in the conversation and later we become friends. And when I completed my studies from the university, my friend Gokul, once we met him and he asked us, what do you want to do with your life after this? And our question was ready, as many other Santal boys. Yes, we will find some job because my parents, I'm the first generation learners from my family and uh, they are still working in the field, and I want to earn. That was my target. And he said, fine, it is very good. 
but I have one, since you are my friend, I can give you one suggestion also. You can lead your way in other way also, where you can earn as well as you can help the fellow people of your village to grow up the way you have, you are growing up. That means to help them to get education in your village because you are the only one who is going to the school. And we thought, well, it is a very good idea. So we started that way. And we found one organization, bought a land, a barren land. Because 20 years back, and even now, I think the situation hasn't changed much. The tribal children here, the Sankhans are majority. They have so many problems in the formal schools. First of all, the Sankhans children, they have their own strong cultural heritage. They have their distinct language and their way of life. And when they go to the formal school, the first conflict that, that arises that the state school's policies idea of assimilating them to the mainstream culture which they don't want to. Yeah. And through the school education, they want to give them the middle class values, which they have a different value system in their own culture and tradition and in the village. So that is where the conflict arises, and the whole curriculum is prepared on that. Because if you see the curriculum, you see, you don't find any tribal children's way of life. You know, maybe one picture, black, curly hair, this is the Santa, they see them till the dance. But they have also their richness, which they don't serve. So that is the first conflict where it arises. Second is the medium of instruction. Most of the teachers, they speak in Bengali here. And the children speak in Shantali, so they don't communicate each other. They, they don't understand. So the rhyme that they memorize or they read among the children of the teachers, they memorize it without understanding it. And slowly, even the method of teaching that the government provides to the teachers is basically to address the problem of the mainstream Bengali children. Not the tribal children, their problem is different because of the language and cultural problem that they face in the process of learning. There is no mechanism in that. But they have to sit in the same format of evolution system. Same question, same marks, and we just uh, grade them that, oh, you got just five, so you are just ignorant, you are foolish. So, going to education for a Santar children is like lo losing his self-esteem and losing his, it's, it's uh, demoralizing him just to get insulted to the teachers and in front of the others. Just think, a tribal boy is so confident in his village, can sing and play drums, and the girls can dress up herself so well, which we see in the cinemas and in art forms, and can make uh, hunting materials, and so many things, and the way they do the wall paintings, everything. Why is these children, when go to the classroom, become so timid? Why did they come so bad benches? What is the reason? Reason because the whole education system, still what is going is not meant for the tribal children. Because the, it's meant keeping in mind for the mainstream children. And we are forcefully being accommodated because we have no choice. Realizing these problems, we thought that we will start our own school, which will start through our mother tongue. We will include our history, our culture, our music, because going to 
mainstream school is losing oneself, you know, and uh, one culture. So why we can grow up and march into the mainstream culture along with our own cultural traits, with our own strengths, and it is possible. It is difficult, but not impossible. And uh, we started uh, preparing the books, primers, and uh, curriculum of our own. And gradually, children start to learn it from their own mother tongue. And slowly, Bengali, English, and others. So that is, they are doing a very confidently, are doing a very well in the mainstream school. But ultimately, since we have no Santali high schools and colleges now, we have to go to the government and colleges. So we have taken the Bengali script. We introduce the letters and numbers through Santali. For example, in Bengali, how we learn A? We learn A for arm. But, but if you just show a man go to a Santal boy, he will say, that is what arm? It is, arm means you in Santal. Or Odie Ojogod, we learn like that. But if you just show him a snake, he said, no, no, the being. So it is so confusing for a small child. And, and um, so this is where we just found our methodology and teaching methods, everything. And it, 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 it is doing very well. And now, after 20 years later, we see many of our students have come up and started in the university. They have been in the government jobs also. And they are, many of them are self-employed. And they are doing up very confidently. So this is our journey of 25 years. So maybe when question comes. This is fascinating. Let me move to yoga now. And uh, perhaps you can tell us how on the Oracle philosophy of education I and mean, how, why would you call it alternative? And I think what, I think Gore makes a very interesting point. I want to return to that later on. That at some point of time, you have to be asking things back again. That where does the process end? Like, can you remain? I mean, in high school, you might get there. So I mean, that's also the question I have in mind. But you can first do tell us a bit about the Oracle philosophy of education. Uh, thank you very much for, well, for the invitation. Um, just to get you on the right platform, because listening carefully to this particular model, that is very close to reality, uh, our world is actually utopia. Just the other extreme of that what we have heard. Um, to accommodate you, I just want to give you some parameters to come back to reality. Our world is close to Pondicherry, about 3,000 people are living there in uh, more or less 50 communities. 59 nations are based there. Uh, a lot of German, French, Americans, all over the world. And then about 1,200 Indians, most of them South Indians and, and, and North Indians. Now just to mention this to get the frame. Uh, what is alternative on, on this particular part? Alternative is number one. Um, it has been understood as a, a city of human unity. It is specified, and clarified, and declined as a city. There is no gender, there is no property, there is no religion, there is no um, uh, uh, equality as an issue. All the parameters, I was listening very carefully to the Bangladesh uh, colleagues of us, uh, which is a very secular based society, spiritually oriented on the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo uh, and the mother, which I try to explain a little bit later. Um, the basic idea is not to do what has been already done in Oliver as an idea, but so to try something which has not been done since 50 years. And what has not been done, number one, it's a group of people, a total of 3,000, 
without leadership, without ruler, with, I mean, with a kind of semi-basic democracy structure, which still does exist, where all the people together, as all the nations together, have on a day-to-day -day basis to, um, to decide their, their, their daily life and their, their politics, if you want to say so. As a foundation by construction, so there is also the new government involved. Coming back to the educational aspect, um, also more in the theoretical terms. Uh, when you're talking about education and you see your science and, and, the, and the integral approach and so on, and it's still a, a vision of education and, and taking the aspect of growth. Yeah? The topic is growth. So when I was listening to you and listening to me too, how we are going to define growth? Everyone knows in the year 2030, 2040, 2050, there will be a dramatic change. Yeah? Also all the qualifications we have now, they are not any more relevant. Also I don't talk about computer and robots, and I'm talking about that we know definitely that the campus, uh, uh, campus will disappear. Homeschooling is going to come. So it means a tendency of custom -made individual education and for the own courses is going to increase. The teacher is not anymore the guy who knows he's a facilitator, he's a coach. Yeah? There will be more and more projects coming. Uh, there is a kind of e-platform that's going to come in all topics. So the, the question of knowledge is not anymore the question of transfer from a learned, educated teacher to his pupil. That is the way of looking at education from the outer side, from the economical side, from a curriculum which has been designed during industrialization. What we have now in schools nowadays in America, in Germany, in France and Europe is basically the written philosophy and assumptions of a society which should come for the generation who is alive. So I'm designing, my father wanted to help me to do this one because it was an image of the coming society. The point now is, it doesn't work. If you're looking 20 years ahead, nothing of this what we are able to do and have learned are of particular relevance for schools. They are in terms of topics relevant. So what to do? All of it is made around this philosophy. So we have no, no fixed curricula. Uh, we have no fixed school system. What we have invented, is, so to speak, is that we are now, maybe one step before. This what you were talking about, the growth of a society and the change of society, is that what we are going to call self-expression, as of in psychological term, uh, nature or the nurture. So we're talking, about, we're talking about nurture, how you're getting people up as a social being. The other part, which is the Indian part, which is the part of Rousseau, which is the part of Fuebel, which is the part of Pesta which is the part of Krishna Modi, which is the part of Tagore, it's that it's self -reveal. The part when the human being, the individual, it's revealing its own capacity. That is the education of the future. The skills and the techniques go to the computer, get an e-platform. The, the art of education will be to find teachers and tools and a method to develop in a more consistent and systematic way the inner being. You call it what you want. Yeah? In real terms, it means people have to get more empathy, they have to be more truthful, they have to be more communicating. All this has been asked for. So, the method, it's complicated. We, will, we, we call it, as means we, we call it free progress. Free progress, why? Because it's the development of an individual in his own being, in his own rhythm, in his own uh, destination, if you want to say. And then, it's a great idea, but very complicated to implement. So you can have ideas as much as you have in your stock, so to speak. After 20 years, and I'm an educationist by profession, you get tired. And again, and try again, the student is not willing to do again, uh, a new method, you have to work hard. And after some time, you're getting tired. You say, well, I'm taking the book from Tagore, I'm taking the book from Montessori, I'm taking the book. So it is a permanent effort and a permanent challenge to, to grow, to make progress. That makes sense 
for the philosophy or, or, or with the background of Schrodinger's philosophy. It is not a concept of social engagement. Schrodinger is not the philosopher of social engagement. He's a philosopher of transformation of consciousness. So all our education, all our perspectives, it's directed in that what might be the future in spiritual sense, not in economic sense. I could continue there, but I think we should have a discussion and an exchange, so I will leave it there to go deeper. As a matter of fact, to, to make uh, figures to it, we have about six big schools, six, for about 400 people. Yeah. Primary school, crash, pre-crash, primary, kinder, uh, kindergarten, primary, secondary, higher secondary. So the relation between Teacher and student, in my case, is one to is very crowded five. Yeah? Otherwise, I'm sitting there with two, three students, and it makes sense. It's nice to work. It makes children also free to express themselves. But it's a luxury. But I'm just a little. Those are two fascinating instances of uh, what one might call, for want of a better word, alternative education, um, really they're deviating from the kind of establishment tradition in so many ways. Uh, another question is, I think, Boro, you touched on slightly near towards the end of your presentation, that what happens afterwards? And I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of a very um, disenchanting thoughts of the Marxist philosopher Louis Salthuser, that you know, education is basically a repressive method. You're kind of basically preparing you know, kind of subjects for the capitalist state. You, it's all about integration into the mainstream system. And the process obviously works by punishing those who opt out and rewarding those who excel. And that's our, our prizes, our grades, our marks, our jobs, our internships. Everything is based on this kind of uh, carrot and stick system. And I think the most um, radical method of departure from this establishment system of incentives like you mentioned Krishnamurti, you mentioned Rabindranath, and they have moved away. Now the question is, you know, how far does it extend? And Boro, you mentioned that uh, you stop at high school, so you have this really radical space for primary school where you uh, introduce the Santan children into what is more natural, and I was immediately thinking of Bhogi Vathyango when he was talking about how you know, the sort of you speak in the Gikuru at home and then you come to, you know, school and that harmony is broken and then you become a kind of colonized subject. And so and here you you're taking care of it on that end. But it's almost like there comes to there has to come a point when you have to go back to the system. You know, and if you can't, I mean how far, I mean what kind of citizens are these people? And I'm just purely anecdotally, I, I was talking to somebody who graduated from Rishi Valley School and she was saying that, oh, I love being at Rishi Valley, it was amazing. But you know, it has really made me unfit for competitive life. I'm sort of, I'm not really into it. And this is a person who is a creative artist, a very creative person, but they've, you know, they've moved away from, and there was a sense of a disjuncture, and she wasn't re regretting it, she was saying it in a kind of wistful sense that I didn't really become a citizen in that sense. So that's my question to both of you, and maybe I'll start with Boro, that what happens afterwards? You know, how do you, when you create this um, students who have their sense of identity as distinct as it should be from the kind of mainstream system, um, where does it end? I mean, if you want to be a doctor, an engineer, a professor, or whatever, all the conventional things, or obviously, are there other methods of being, like becoming an environmental activist who actually sort of energizes these other ways of thinking, or being a teacher? I mean, so, so what is the future? Or do you, at some point of time, have to go back to integration? Yeah. Uh, well, being a teacher, I think uh, when a student ultimately is not and cannot achieve his goal or what he want to be or she want to be, I think it is also a failure of a, of a teacher when the student can't reach his goal or aspiration level. So we cannot uh, 
avoid or we cannot reject, we cannot just avoid the modernity in the world. What we try to give them or help our student is to handle them and to prepare them and give them that maturity that they can consciously march and not march but consciously interact with the mainstream society. Keeping his own cultural ethos and his identity. And we have this process also. Uh, as I said, we start with our own cultural roots from known to unknown, from simple to complex. First, grow up your own culture, what is there, your history. And you know Bengali culture, history, and slowly, and after schooling, we help them to cultivate or explore their or help them to uh, explore their talents. If somebody wants to be uh, uh, study in the university, we support him. If somebody wants to become uh, a farmer, we have also um, farm. We have also agricultural land. We have also bio farm. We have beekeeping. We have all sorts of um, extracurricular uh, activities where student can learn. Uh, while in the schooling process also. So, and actually we have also vocational training programs. If somebody wants to do something with his creative art or uh, anything, so we help them. And after the, when they grow up, it is up to them when they want to leave. We also take them for the educational to Kolkata and to Delhi. And we show them the, even the slums and also the big cities and buildings, what is happening there. And by seeing those, you just make your own choice. This is what your village life or your parents are, where you have come from, and this is where the mainstream and the city life is. So you make your own choice. And that way, I think, uh, and let it be a uh, conscious decision. Not that you have to become this and that. Not like that, but things which we love, uh, which, uh, what your talent is, and we help them to grow in that way. That's uh, very interesting. I mean, you make, uh, do you have a pattern of um, what kind of decisions they make? I mean, how many people choose the traditional or the ancestral way of life and how many people Sort of move away and you put it very evocative towards environment, you can't reject it. So, do you have a sense of is, is there any kind of pattern, even kind of a random? Uh, random, I can't really I'm just saying, is there a pattern in the kind of choices they make? I mean, do some, how many of them, I'm not asking for a percentage or any proportion, just a kind of an observational. Um, do more, more people choose the path to modernity, as you said? Or do more students choose to kind of live within the ancestral and the traditional value systems? I think you just, it is very difficult to leave, simply live in your own way of life, traditional way of life in this situation now. And at the same time, I think living their own tradition and their way of life and to live in the city is also very difficult for them at this juncture because they are the first generation or maybe second generation uh, educated uh, people. So most of them what they do is just try to make a balance in between both. Some of them are, have become school teachers but still have their parents at home. They come to the town and cities interact with the people here. And some of them are in the cities also, some of some of our students are in Assam, are in Bangalore, working in the Bikutet. But they come back to their village, they have their roots here. So they are doing that. So not like that, that those who are going to city, they won't come back. But on the other one, only living in the village, it's not possible for us. So just, uh, just to find a space in between and just make uh, a balance.
very well. It's not a binary choice, obviously. One has to, there are ways of creatively uh, sort of bridging both sides. So, Jurgen, I was wondering if you could say a bit about that, because you also talked a lot about sort of moving away from this traditional model, and yet, you know, what next? You know, is there, is integration or partial integration a kind of, of inevitable uh, or desirable and next chapter for that? Uh, we, we have found a way which is really uh, an option of, for, for, both, for both directions. And I, I just, if I take this in detail, what you were talking about, I can bring it really to Oroville in a different surrounding, but we have the same question also. In principle, there are no examinations. There's no examination. It goes through all the educational uh, phases, primary school, secondary school, without examination. That is actually the principle, and it stops with the last school. No examination. Mother's explicit uh, expression. But in the meantime, this was a decision and accepted by the people who came to our will, 1968, 72, after your uh, independence, uh, 80s, educated, and they said, well, we don't want to have anything to do with that education we were talking about. So free for all, free progress, no examination. And we are still going this way. Uh, as the success, I can explain later. On the other hand, there are some people, youngsters who have grown up, born in our world, much later. Uh, not inspired by Sri Aurobindo and the mother of God, yeah, they can speak the name. Modern generation, 17, 18, they have different questions to solve. They have sometimes the idea to say, well, what should I do in this boring place? I want to go out. So, and if I want to go out, I need an examination. So as a result, we have two schools, two secondary schools. One without any examination, and one without the examination which does the degree, the same degree your school is doing, uh, London based or English based, so you can go out and can study. So one is called last school, no examination. The other one is called future school with the wrong name, with examination. I'm teaching the other. So in terms of proportion, how much going out and staying in, uh, I would say two thirds staying and one third is are going. But more and more they're coming back. They're going out, realizing it smells nice outside, it is also a bit attractive and a good sound and vibration, but they're coming back because they're realizing that after some time that is not that what it's what what I have learned. What they have learned it's complicated to say because it's, they have not learned mathematics in particular. They're not genius in um, in, in physics. Maybe some of them. I'm not. What they have learned, and there's an observation, I had just made an evaluation about uh, your own education one, one and a half years ago. The amazing part is that uh, if you're making interviews with them, there is a kind of deep connection with themselves. Whatever is the psychic, yeah? They have the, the, the quality, they're talking, and then they are in the topic if they're going over the edge, which I'm doing from time to time, then there's a mechanism they're going back, controlling themselves and starting again to talk. That is one of the biggest achievements I've seen. It's not in the curriculum. It's the attitude, it's the atmosphere, it's the relation, it's the whole environment. The second part is um, more the subtle way. Forget the examinations. They have the quality of, they are not changes. It's amazing, even with girls, they would say, ah, they are just, beating each other, absolutely fair approach, they're helping each other without any interference. They have that sense of, uh, we are there to be the same. That's that self for the same cause. And the third element is, um, I was in America, and it's good to know, yeah? and I've learned there in particular what means is to be a salesperson. To stand up and say, well, I'm the great chef, and what that. Part of ego to show off is not there. And when they are talking, they are cap capable, brilliant, sometimes not brilliant, but they don't have that element, I'm selling myself. Yeah? I can do it, but they not. And that is a quality which is more needed in the future to come than any other quality. 
And if you're reading that, it means you're coming from the States, if you're looking at, uh, at Facebook and you're looking at Twitter and you're looking at Google, the people, they don't look anymore for explanation. They employ people who have the capacity to work in the team, who have the capacity to have empathy, who have the capacity to uh, work in groups. That is the, the skills and qualification we need. And that is the old tradition, and if you're going back to Tagore, and going back to Sri Aurobindo, and going back to uh, Krishnamurti, and going back to Rousseau, and going back to Fleur, whatever. They are looking on this particular line. And if you're emphasizing this more and more, and India has the best source for this kind of qualification, uh, Martin came to just work on one of the issues. We and your country has to come back to have a look into that models we have. Shantanikitan, Aurivel, uh, Krishnamurti to some extent. Uh, it's time to, to re-look, to, to reinvent these great ideas for a modern time which is going to come and a very challenging and uh, frightening time, to be honest. Can we open to questions? I think this is something on which uh, all of us have various stakes in many different ways. Education is, parents, participants. Uh, so I, I think at this point I'd love to open uh, the floor to questions for all these interesting models of departure. Yeah, uh, so I visited Orville in the year 2000 and I was been hearing about Shantinigaton for since I was young. I want I was wondering uh, what is the idea of Shantinigaton in in the rest of India is it is it seen as a success? The people practitioners within Shantinigatan do you see it as a success? Ashoka University is trying to do something a bit different. Uh, how does Ashoka look at these models? How can I answer the question? Because I have myself done a PhD in Shantinigatan. Obviously, my PhD was very successful. <laughs> but what else should I say? I can't praise myself or I would like to put myself down. So anybody else will be. He's <coughs> not, he's at Shantinikita, not part of Shantinikita, should reply to that. I can say as an outside observer from, say from Delhi or from the US or from Calcutta who watch it, I think this should be known much more than it is. It is actually not known enough. And I, my experience was, I mean, I've written on this subject, I've written a book on education, and my colleague, um, Anunanda Dr. Gupto, um, who's sitting right here, who teaches at Vishwarati, and she, she and I engaged in a series of exchanges after I've written. And she told me, you see, a lot of the things you're saying, we already do it. And I, I have to say that I admitted that even the kind of philosophy of liberal arts we have uh, you know, Ashoka kind of getting a kind of a 19th century American model to a kind of Indian soil. Uh, from a Shantanikatan perspective, some of it actually looks like reinventing the wheel. And what that tells is, not, not all of it, some of it, I mean things like the Steiner method of schooling, you know, the walled out schools, which are actually quite popular even in a place like Delhi, it's coming up, which is, you know, say something. In the South, we can understand. They've always been sensitive to alternative models of education. But uh, a lot of it um, was happening here. And since I've become a regular visitor to Vishwarati, I mean, next to Anun and Shudev, I've been introduced to all of it. So I have to say that um, uh, there isn't enough of a narrative. People do pay lip service to talk about Aurobindranath and all, and then I think they move on. So I, I think that wonderful work that is being done here needs to be noticed a lot more widely. So that's my perception. But others maybe from the audience can say something about that. I have a question. Should we just wait to see if anybody else would like to ask a question? Can you get the mic? I had another question actually for the panel, especially because we are speaking today in a place which is uh, uh, which in some ways seems to be very far away for the, from the polarization that the country is seeing politically. Uh, but at the same time, nobody is too far away from what is happening. My question is, uh, and this is something that's really been worrying many of us, how do we equip our children 
especially children who already come with marginalizations of gender, sexual preference, or caste, religion, how do we equip them in our classrooms um, to be able to resist the forces of power that they will constantly face in different ways? I sometimes, when I, when I listen to educationists like yourselves, I try to imagine a world that is softer, gentler, um, that can I live in Bangalore. I know the children of Rishikali, and from Rishikali they moved to Srishti School of Design. And then that's another very beautiful protected place. But then what role did they play outside of it? It's something we're all worried about. But there's also a world out there that they get into where every day as a woman, as a lower caste person, as a person of a specific community or religion, um, you are going to face a power that will not speak sweetly to you. <coughs> How do we equip our children to deal with such monsters without becoming them themselves? What do we do? Look, look here. I think Moro has said this very beautifully. The one solution for this is make the children confident about themselves, which means about them as individuals, as members of their family, of their village, and of their language, and of their culture. Once they feel totally integrated into their own tribal environment, make them strong personalities, confident of themselves, then also, I believe, you have a good chance of withstanding, as we call, the demons of the outside world. Like um, um, lack of integration, like uh, modernity, like uh, discriminations of all kinds. And I think in Borobatsky, <coughs> he has, as he said himself, come from an uneducated family as the first uh, generation learner, and now he is a voice of his own tribe, not only in Shantinikitan but in West Bengal. And uh, this is um, uh, this is uh, a result of the education he received by teaching his own children, his uh, village, and. Also, I must say, by having been a student of Shantanikita and Vishwamarati. I think you should agree with that. So, uh, this is the solution. Become a competent human being. Uh, the, the question is, is the daily life, which is a brutal one and a, a harsh one, uh, that is no education can solve any problem. <laughs> education is always a long-term story. Um, I can only speak for our willers. I mean, we have that kind of, you call it, psychic education, yeah? I mean, it's physical education, mental and vital, which is touching actually on this particular element, the sense for uh, honesty, friends, for gratitude, the sense for uh, aspiration. I mean, it's a value. It's a value system we have to grow up into. It's not a question. We have to learn that girls have to be respected. That doesn't help. You have to be in a system of values where you're going to see the whole environment, your neighbor, male, female, uh, animal or not, as creation. And it works. I wouldn't say it's the only place. No, no, no. We have everything in a very limited way. But in principle, it's a matriarchal hour, to be honest. And the women are very strong in our very dominant, but in a very organical way. There is no obvious resistance. There is no other gender issues. I have students, girls, 17, 18, 16, if you're asking them, is there a kind of racism? Are they bullied around? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. But it is a discussion, and it's open, and it's uh, uh, reflected. It's not something we don't talk about. Uh, not something we don't want to hear. It is there in a limited way. The way is only to get a more subtle understanding about what human being is. 
that you're not only a rational, economical, uh, money-oriented uh, being. And that takes time, it takes time, it takes time, it works. And one of us, let me just come back, one of us, one of the schools, gets very, very modern, it's uh, an Austrian from Germany, actually, and a theological background. Uh, a special school, very successful, also in Germany. Any more questions? And the third question at the back. Can anybody get the microphone uh, at the back, please? Uh, 1901. And there we learned botanomy through ashram shomi learning, and we learned how to express ourselves uh, freely. After 10 years of schooling, I went to the art faculty here again in Kalamuram. And after 19 years of Vishwabharati education, I went abroad to France and I was I studied there at the Sorbonne and later I brought up my children under the French system. And then I started to compare the different trends as I have friends in Ohio Valley, you know, the Krishnamurti school. And I had friends from Rishi Valley and different uh, exclusive ed pedagogical structures all around the world. And then I started to compare and I came to the conclusion that in some way Tagore is the culmination of Freubel and of Petsalotsi and of Neil of Wales and also of Charles Frenet from Belgium who sort of uh, showed the beauty of language, who taught the beauty of words by making them visualize the words. And Tagore is the culmination in many ways of all these theories and he really put into practice without knowing those parallel things happening all over the world. And that is the mystery of Tagore's teaching. It is the notion of freedom as the basis. You choose your own subjects and you have a very privileged relationship with your teacher, with nature, and with the communities that are around you. I'm talking about Shantiniketan that existed about 50 years ago. And uh, recently I, ha I had the chance to teach at Patavavan. And again I compared how Patavavan is evolving in the modern times. And I came to understand that in my class there were many second first generation learners from tribal families and my challenge was how to meet them. I decided to go towards them by learning together Santali language, visualizing the words, bringing in Charles Frenet and all other theories and by learn learning the words with, along with them I could reconcile these children with the so-called uh, uh, children from uh, other homes. Uh, that was my experience. When if one has to invent somewhere, one has to invent all the time as Tigor did. He invented every day a new method. Thank you. Thank you so much.